Hello, I'm Bo Weidemar. This is the fifth out of 10 videos on consequential modeling in lifecycle inventory analysis. The title of this video is Learning from Non-Intuitive Results. For 29 years, I've been trying to explain consequential LCA. If you want to read the whole story, you can look at my blog post about this. However, what I found is it's been much more difficult than I ever expected. And of course, you start wondering what could be the reasons for this. And some years ago, uh, some of my colleagues made a study where we together tried to find what are the what are the reasons, um, what are the arguments that people are using for doing attributional instead of consequential. And one point was that there is an intuitive parallel between attributional LCA and product declarations. It's about what's in the product, where does it come from? And you don't immediately think about the consequences of buying it. So another point was that it doesn't immediately seem to indicate any comparison. If you're standing in a supermarket with, let's say, a liter of milk, are you comparing it to the juice? Are you comparing it to another type of milk? Um, you cannot immediately say, what are you comparing it to? So um, why do you need to have a comparison about the consequences of buying it to not buying it because eventually you will buy something else so how should you deal with that situation also small decisions like buying a liter of milk doesn't intuitively appear to have any consequences so does it really matter to talk about consequences here absolute impact seems also to be easier to grasp than relative impacts, so impacts that are related to changes. And also consequential LCA give counterintuitive results, things that make you start thinking um, and that people don't like. Uncertainty is also larger when you are looking at things that happens in the future and we don't like uncertainty, right? And then, of course, attributional LCA has a much stronger application history. Many more people are doing attributional LCAs than consequential LCAs. So why shouldn't we do it too? So my conclusion is that all of these reasons somehow just reflect that Consequential LCA requires some additional intellectual effort. That is, it runs counter to the immediate intuition. And that makes it, you know, not the first choice, you could say. But for us, counterintuitive results is exactly what we learn from. I mean, if our analysis always came out with the intuitive results, why would we have to do the analysis in the first place? So let's look at some of the controversial, you could say, or at least counterintuitive results that you can get with consequential modeling. I'm not going to read all of these out because we're going in and having a closer look at each of them. But the top one, that we would have more global warming with bio-based substitutes than with fossil-based, runs counter to a lot of intuition about bio being, you know, more natural, must be better for the environment, sucks up a lot of CO2 from the air. Mm. But, what happens in reality is that when we go out and harvest a crop, we are actually inducing deforestation. 
also called indirect land use. Um, part of the indirect land use is an intensification, so more fertilizer on the soil, but a, a quite a large part of the indirect land use change is deforestation. And if you look at the amount of deforestation, um, the amount of indirect land use change compared to what else is going on in the life cycle, you can see it's a fairly big share. And for that reason, when you compare to the fossil fuel based parallel, um, if you say that we want to use um, a fossil fuel based um, raw material instead of uh, bio based, you actually find often that this is not such a bad idea. So the conclusion that there is more global warming with bio based than fossil based raw materials in industry, this becomes intuitive right when we understand that farming is not CO2 neutral and that ILOP can make up more than half of the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions from biological raw materials. Another thing that might sound counterintuitive is that certified forestry products should be damaging biodiversity. Well, that's just running counter to the whole idea of this certified forestry, isn't it? Well, if you look at this picture here, I can try to explain why we have a problem. The red dotted line of the red dashed line is a line running from zero impact and zero yield. And up to the right hand corner where we have a plantation forest. Now a plantation forest, you could say, maybe have a hundred percent of the biodiversity impact, but it also has a very high yield, at least six cubic meters per hectare. Some can go much higher than that. But it means that to have more biodiversity per cubic meter, we would need to be below that red line. If we are above that line, we're actually having a higher biodiversity impact per cubic meter. Not per hectare, but per cubic meter. And the cubic meter is what we're asking for. So the problem is that even if you do a little disturbance in a forest, it has a big biodiversity impact. When you have an already damaged forest and you increase the yield in that, the additional biodiversity impact is not that high. So the curve, you could say, of the normal uh, forestry is lying above the red line. Most certified forests as well. A biodiversity managed forest would have to be below the red line and getting there requires a very dedicated biodiversity management and it's very difficult. So therefore, actually the conclusion is that the best thing you can do is to buy from plantation forests because there you get more biodiversity because the more you can buy in terms of product with the same biodiversity value, the more forest you can leave to be natural and undisturbed. So high yields is actually not such a bad idea if you can then leave other areas free. So it becomes intuitively right that certified forestry has a problem when we understand the certification does not manage for a high biodiversity per produced volume. It may manage per hectare, but we need certified forestry to manage per produced volume. Another intriguing thing is that increasing soy protein in feed should be good for global warming. Sounds very counterintuitive. 
Now let me try to explain how that can come about. If we ask for one kilogram of soybean meal, the CO2 equivalent of that production system is 1.04 kilogram of CO2. When we refine the soy oil, we should add 0 0.09, so we get 0 0.13 altogether. The soy oil is about 200 grams per kilogram of soybean meal. Now that, when you put that byproduct of soy oil on the market, it displaces a refined palm oil. And because palm oil is such a relatively dirty production with a marginal impact of 1.26 kilograms of CO2 equivalents per 200 grams of oil, then you can easily calculate that we have 1.13 minus 1.26 of the total system to produce soybean meal. So here we have these two equal each other out. So we have zero coming out here. And we have for one kilogram of soybean meal, a negative CO2 impact. So a reduction in CO2 impact of 0 0.13 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. So because we are displacing a much more damaging production by our byproduct, then it becomes intuitively obvious that we actually would want to have more soy protein in our feeds. In the same ballpark, we have the counterintuitive output that there is no effect of substituting palm oil by soy oil. And why is that? Well, the amount of soy oil is constrained by the demand for soy protein. As we saw before, whenever you ask for soy protein, you get 200 grams of soy oil. So when you ask for soy oil specifically, it just means that some other consumer will not be able to get this soy oil because you don't produce more soy oil just because there is a demand for it. So the consumer has to settle for palm oil which is the marginal oil on the market. So palm oil is increased. If you instead demand palm oil, obviously more production of palm oil happens and you'll get exactly the same result. So there's no effect of substituting palm oil by soy oil. This becomes intuitively right when we understand that purchasing from a constraint market prevents others from buying thus increasing the demand for the marginal supply. Exactly the same happens when we say there is no effect of substituting leather and plastic, because the amount of hides for leather is constrained by the demand for meat. You don't produce cows for leather, you produce cows for meat. And therefore the leather becomes a byproduct. You don't get more leather production, you don't get more cows when you demand more leather. It just reduces the availability to another consumer. The other consumer then has to settle for the marginal alternative, which is fake leather or full leather if you like. Well, basically it's polyurethane. So production of polyurethane is increased. When you demand instead just the full leather, you'll basically have an increase in that and you'll get the same result. So it's intuitively right when we understand that purchasing on a constraint market just prevents others from buying, thus increasing the demand for the marginal supply. What about recycled paper? Isn't that a good idea to ask for recycled paper? Well, approximately 80% of paper is sorted and recycled. Increased demand no longer increases the collection rate. So your demand for recycled paper just means that there will be no more available for another consumer. 
the other consumer then has to settle for primary paper and the production of primary paper is increased. Your demand for unspecified or even for primary paper just leads to more production of primary paper. Again, the same result. This again becomes intuitively right when we understand that purchasing from a constraint market prevents others from buying, thus increasing demand for the primary supply. What about manure and artificial fertilizer? Isn't it a good idea to put manure on your soil rather than artificial fertilizer? Well, the amount of manure is constrained by the demand of meat. It's just like the heights. There is no more manure being produced just because you ask for it. Your demand for manure will reduce the availability for another consumer. The other consumer has to go for artificial fertilizer, and artificial fertilizer is increased. If you demand artificial fertilizer, obviously more of that will be produced with the same result. So, I think I've said this three times already, so I won't repeat it again. A slightly different picture we obtain when we look at boycotting something like wood from specific tropical species. Now, if the market for a specific wood species is constrained, the production is not influenced by demand. So in this situation, if you're boycotting whatever XX wood, this will increase the amount available to others. So others that want to buy this amount, that you liberate it, then the result is that the production of this wood is unchanged. This is intuitively right when we understand that the boycott of a constraint market just enables others to buy. If you really want to change the amount of this wood to be consumed, you would need either a global ban or you would need a global or at least a protection of an area. If you, you can increase the protected area of this species, that would make a change. It might also sound counterintuitive that there is no effect of sending corrugated board for recycling. Now, we can only understand that when we look at the market as being saturated. Here are some numbers from the United States and from Europe from 2018 and 2017. The amount collected of corrugated board is very, very high, especially in the US, 96% is collected. In Europe, 85 might be higher today. How much is then recycled? Well, only 63% and 73%. So in Europe, it's close to the maximum possible. Because, of course, you need fibers that actually stick together in the end. So there is a limit to how much these things can be reused. That means that we have a surplus on the market in the US of 33% in 2018 and in Europe of 12% in 2017. Unless we can send that to some other place where it's used, we actually have to landfill this in the US or burn it in Europe. And this means that it's actually intuitively right that we have no effect of sending corrugated board for recycling, because in the end it will just be disposed of as ordinary waste anyway. So, I hope you've learned something, at least I find it provoking every time we discover these new kind of, hmm, that's interesting. So thanks for your attention and looking forward to see you at the next video.